looked upon the cliff where Hilltop stood. I can still see its hanging roofs against the cypress trees. But Hilltop is no more. There is only a scar of jutting rock where once its windows glittered in the California sun. My Aunt Amelia's house still stands next door. I was a welcome guest within its walls, but to me it will always be a house of fear. I was afraid that Sunday morning in September. I was afraid before the doorbell rang. Stay in this house another day. What is it, Major? What's the matter? It's all right. It's all right, Amelia. I'll handle this. Where's his room? It's there. Just but leave I... this to me. I'll take care of Cohelan. 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 Are you in there? He's gone. He can't be. He said last night. Well, I mean, he must be around somewhere. I'll search the place from top to bottom. Would anyone mind telling me what all this excitement is about? You've been harboring a dangerous man. A man who is... Wouldn't it be fair to Jeff if we waited until we find him and then he can speak for himself? Well, by all means, find him. But where? Well, supposing I look in the garage and see if his car is still there. Just what did Dr. Hartley tell you? Jeff, are you in there? Jeff! Jeff, are you all right? Major Badger, hurry up! What's the trouble? What's the trouble? Jeff, I'm getting in the motor. Oh, my. 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 If only I had listened to the doctor. If you had only listened to him on the train. There was something wrong even then, something terribly wrong. I should have seen it in your eyes the first time we met. Well, hello, Jeff. Oh, hello, Doc. Patient in Los Angeles, or were you just doing the town? Oh, medical dinner at the Biltmore last night. What have you been up to? Oh, I spent a couple of days at the General Hospital. Those dizzy spells again? Nothing serious, I hope. When I need a doctor, I'll come to see you. <laughs> I was getting some technical stuff for the Veterans Hospital I'm working on. Didn't I hear somewhere that Ben Shepard donated the land for it? That's right. Join me in a cup of coffee? Uh, no, thanks. I've just had breakfast. I'll see you later, then. Oh, Jeff. Yes? I don't like those recurring periods of depression of yours. Why don't you come in and let me give you a checkup? One of these days. Morning, Elmer. Oh, good morning, sir. How about a little breakfast? You can start me off with some black coffee. Yes, sir. May I? Just save the train from being wrecked. By throwing salt over your shoulder? Oh, by showing proper respect to the powers of darkness. Powers of darkness. <laughs> what have we here? A disbeliever? Let's see what the tea leaves say about you. Your coffee, sir. Oh, thank you. There's a trick my grandmother taught me. She learned it from an old witch in Ireland. And so you've been drinking coffee ever since? Yeah, that's beside the point. I see your name scribbled on the bottom of the cup. It starts with uh, an L, doesn't it? It does not. Ah, oh, but it does. The tea leaves never lie. I see it now. L, N. Your name is Ellen. Isn't it? Yes. 
You'll not be so quick to scoff now, will you? Now, let's see where you're from. I see a large body of water, not so large as an ocean, but the next thing to it. Now, uh, what could that be? Lake Superior. It's the largest lake in America. Then you're from Lake Superior? From Minnesota. Now we'll go into your destination. It's Pinecliff, of course. You wouldn't be on this train. But where in Pinecliff? I see here an old woman and the letter A. Now, let me see. The old woman is standing in the garden and she's talking to her neighbor. So you're going to the city, she says. What train will you be coming back on? Saturday's train, he says. Then you'll have a pleasant companion, she says, for my niece Ellen is coming to visit me and she'll be on Saturday's train. You see, the tea leaves never lie. And uh, neither do the tea bags. <laughs> <laughs> but how will I know her, I says to Amelia. Sure, now, she says, just look around the parlor car and the prettiest girl there, that'll be Ellen Foster. You're a real Irishman, aren't you? <laughs> You've obviously kissed the blondies, Dan. Kissed it, she says. I wear it on my watch, Bob. And just from what part of Ireland do you come? Flatbush. <laughs> <laughs> This would be an ideal site for the beach club, don't you, Keith? Yeah, it certainly would, Ben. Mm -hmm. Busy, Ben? Oh, uh, come right in, Jeff. Well, we bring the road in here and divide this section into two-acre lots. And mm, hold out this area for the golf course. Hi. How are you, Ben? Hello, Jeff. How is the trip? Fine, thank you. I uh, bought you a little present while I was in Los Angeles. Found it in an antique shop. Hi, Jeff. Clarence? It's a map of an old Spanish land grant. Say, that is an antique. Here's the uh, Ibarra Territory. My grandmother's grandfather, he lived right there. That was before California was a state, wasn't it, Ben? It certainly was. <laughs> I keep forgetting how long your family's lived here. Only since 1820. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Come in. Pardon me, Mr. Shepard. What is it, Mac? Well, Sue told me you were in here. Did you take any blueprints with you when you went down to the city? No, why? Why, the rear elevations are missing. They can't be. I put them in a file Thursday. Well, they're not there now. Well, they must be. Come on, I'll help you look for them. See you later, Ben. Thanks for the map, Jeff. Glad you like it. Jeff seems to be getting awfully absent-minded lately, doesn't he? Well, the boy works too hard. Maybe so, but... Uh... Say, that's quite a map, isn't it? Oh, it's a beauty. Look, here's our beach. That's the old Spanish name for it, Costa del Rey. The Coast of Kings. He never barks at people. He seemed to think I was an intruder. Oh, yes. Of course, that must be it. Is this a private seat? Oh, no. Uh, it's just that there was someone who used to sun here beside this rock. Well, I'll forgive him this time. I must say you own a very particular dog. I don't own him exactly. They own me. Shamrock and Mr. O'Grady. Mr. O'Grady? Isn't that an odd name for a German shepherd? Well, it's Herr von Gradenstein on his papers. I translate it. <laughs> well, I, I guess I ought to go home. I'll walk along with you. What an amazing house. Don't you like it? Yes. I think I do. It looks as if it had wings, as if it could take off and fly across the sea. 
That's the effect I was striving for when I built it. You built it? My house. It certainly belongs exactly where it is, doesn't it? Yes, I think a house ought to blend with its environment. If it's built in a valley, it should crouch between trees. If it's on top of a hill, it ought to be part of the sky. Shamrock up, I'll walk the rest of the way with you. It's nice of you to insist. Isn't it? I'm beginning to like your house more and more. You can't take it all in at the first glance, can you? No, it's like some people that way, I guess. You have to know them a while. Like you, for instance? Yes, I suppose that's true of me, too. We don't have houses like that in Minnesota. Do you mind if I take a closer look at it? I thought you said you were late. Oh, another ten minutes won't matter. I just don't know what to say. You care for a drink? Thank you. Sherry, all right? Yes. What an unusual picture. It's by Del Lopez, the Mexican modernist. Thank you. What's it called? It doesn't have a name. What does it suggest to you? Well, it's not real, but then it's not not real either. It might be a garden in a dream. It might be. Or he dreamed of the girl who belonged in the garden. That's pretty good. And then she became more important in the garden, and perhaps that's why she's out of proportion. Perhaps she did. Perhaps that's why a woman gets out of proportion to a man. I really don't know anything about modern art. There isn't anything to know about it. It's like music. Its form doesn't have to copy nature to please the senses. Or does it? We were talking about art. I was talking about figures. Are you interested in figures? I have a Civiliano. You have a what? Civiliano, an Italian sculptor. I bought one of his porcelains with my first fee. Would you like to see it? Yes, I would. Where is it? Over by the window. Come on, I'll show it to you. This is my good luck charm. It's called Ho Tai, the Chinese goddess of chance. Zabiano always... Oh, Jeff, I'm terribly sorry. Can it be mended? No, it's beyond mending. Uh, well, on a medium, maybe worrying about me. I suppose I should go home. Yes, I suppose you should. Goodbye. Good afternoon, Luella. Hello, Miss Foster. Is Aunt Amelia at home? I didn't see her go out. Ellen. Oh, hello, Aunt Amelia. Were you afraid I was lost? No, I was sure you could take care of yourself. But it was getting late, and I was afraid you'd forgotten about the dance at the country club tonight. Of course not. I just ran into Mr. Cohalan on the beach, and I stopped by his house for a glass of sherry. You were inside Hilltop? Why, yes. You don't disapprove, do you? 
After all, I'm a little old to need a chaperone. But no one's ever been inside Hilltop before. No one. Except Jeff. It's funny. He built it for his bride. Then there's a Mrs. Cohallen. No, Vivian was killed the night before the wedding. How awful. Aunt Amelia. Yes, dear. What was she like? Vivian, she was the most beautiful girl you ever laid your eyes on. She was Ben Shepard's daughter. Ben Shepard? Ben owns most of Pinecliff. That's why it was such a perfect match. Jeff was a protege of his, more like a son. And when he fell in love with Vivian, Ben was delighted. Of course, he adored Vivian, especially after her mother. But I shouldn't talk about her mother. It was such a scandal. Poor Ben. Aunt Amelia, you said that Vivian Shepard was killed. Was it? It was an accident. Jeff told Ben it was bad luck to have a party before the wedding, but Ben insisted, and there were so many people there. Jeff and Vivian stole away in her car, and five minutes later, she was dead in a collision at 12-mile drive. You never can tell what private tragedies people have had, can you? I mean, when you first meet them. He seems so light-hearted on the train. He can be that way sometimes, and the next minute he's strange, like never inviting people into his home and never mentioning Vivian's name. I'll tell you one thing, we've been pretty worried about Jeff, but the way he's been acting. Well, how would you expect him to act after a shock like that? Seeing the woman he loved killed right in front of his eyes? It's a wonder he didn't go out of his mind. Don't get so excited, dear. I'm sorry. And don't get too interested in Jeff Cohallen. There were other attractive men in Pinecliff. Oh, men who aren't... Men who aren't what, Aunt Amelia? Well... After all, he has had a tragedy in his life, and it's only a year ago. Hadn't we better get dressed? Yes. Think of my reputation, Mr. Ferris. But I am thinking of it. A new girl in town seen walking with me in the moonlight while the stag line will give you a rush. I never encourage stag lines. There's no future in them. But in that case, we'll, uh, we'll sneak out quietly, huh? No, thank you. Thank you, but no. Cold climate, Minnesota. Yes, isn't it? Uh, let's go down to the bar and talk it over. All right. I see you know our local hero. We've met. A charming fellow. Yes, he is. I suppose you fall madly in love with him. Everybody else does. Except you, Mr. Ferris. Oh, I think he's just ducky. Did you children enjoy your dance? It was just ducky. Keith, you must sit down and have a drink with us. I thank you. I'd like to. Hello, Amelia. Hello, hello. Welcome home, Dodo. Thank you. Good evening, Major. This is my niece, Ellen Foster. This is Miss Ferris, dear. How do you do? How do you do? And Dr. Hartley. Why, yes, we met on the train. My name is Ferris, too. You, I know. A wolf, Major. Now, you two stay right here and don't you move till we get back. Miss Foster, the only dance I know is a waltz. Will you risk it with me? I'd love to, Dr. Hartley. <laughs> And uh, how were things at the separation center? Did you have a good time? Reno is delightful. I received my discharge papers yesterday. You'll get your copy in the mail. Oh, that calls for a celebration, doesn't it? It certainly does. In that case, I'll take you down to the bar and buy you a drink. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, come now. We're civilized people, aren't we? Well, I guess it can't do any harm. You know, I think it ought to be a lot of fun, now that we're not married anymore. What do you think your chances are? 
Ben and I built more hospitals in the South Pacific in one year than the average architect will see in a lifetime. The only competition I'm worried about is Talbot and Talbot. Huh? Not that I can't compete with them professionally, but they seem to know how to play the uh, political side of it. Well, that won't count here. I hope not. Anyhow, I'm indebted to you for a crack at it. I merely suggested that they invite a local architect to submit plans. Jeff, you're looking pretty seedy. Sure you haven't been working too hard? Well, it's been a pretty hectic week, Ben, but we finished up tonight. Plans are all wrapped and ready for mailing in the morning. Hmm. Hello, Ben, you old darling. Hello, Dodo. Hello, Jeff. There's an admirer of yours looking for you upstairs. Who's that? A girl by the name of Foster. You seem to have made quite a score. Aren't you speaking to me, Jeff? Certainly, Dodo. How are you? Fine. Our uh, congratulations in order? They certainly are. We're celebrating the new freedom. Uh, see you later. Huh? Bye. I think I'll go upstairs, Ben. It's uh, getting a little crowded down here. <laughs> Too long? I'm completely exhausted. <laughs> Do you know? It's called Don't Forget Me. Oh, I remember. They played it a lot last year. Yes, they played it last fall. Is something the matter? No, I didn't eat my dinner. I guess you shouldn't drink on an empty stomach. Excuse me. Here, Butch. Such a little animal, and yet he's got an appetite as big as mine. Well, Jeff doesn't act, sir. Well, maybe he left early. But he looked so worried last night. Well, supposing he's ill and there's no one to take care of him. After all, dear, Jeff's a big boy now. Oh, how nice. We're invited to Ben's fiesta next week. He gives one every year. I think I'll walk over and make sure he's all right. Who, Ben? Oh, oh, oh you mean Jeff. Which way he went? Who? The man. What man? He was hiding in the bushes. Didn't you see him? No. I only saw some branches move, that's all. I've never seen lovelier roses. What are they called? 
Matador, I believe. They grow on the bush out on the terrace. Matador? Oh, of course, after the color of the bullfighter's cape. Or the bull's blood. Jeff, I'm so sorry about Shamrock. safe with me. Do you understand? Suppose I don't want to be safe. Please go now. I'll call you later. All right, Jeff. certified public accountant do? Uh, especially a pretty certified public accountant. I compile actuarial tables for an accident insurance company. What are the odds against a man fracturing his arm? That sort of thing. Oh, what are the odds? 90 to 1 that you won't break your arm this year. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do, it's 2 to 1 that it'll be the right arm. Well, have you noticed that in your practice? No. What I've noticed is that my patients have all their fractures just when I'm ready to sit down to dinner. <laughs> hey, you. Come here a minute. I want to talk to you. Si, senor. Didn't I see you around my place last week? Me? Me, no, senor. I'm sure I saw you hanging around my stable. Me? No, senor. Some other fellow, but not me. Just a minute. I'm... All right, go ahead. I wonder what that was all about. Oh, the morning after the dance, I went over to see if Jeff was all right and there was a prowler behind a bush. Did you see him yourself? No, but Jeff did. Oh. Uh -huh. Cigarette? Thank you. Did you ever compile any figures on the incidence of mental diseases for your insurance company? No, they weren't on our list. Interesting subject. Who's sane and who isn't? Hard to tell sometimes. Uh, do you know anything about paranoia? It's a form of a uh, hallucination, isn't it? Delusions of persecution. Starts with an inability to withstand stresses. Normal person experiences misfortune, throws it off sooner or later. But if a person is psychotic to begin with, he may start to imagine things. He might even begin to imagine there's a conspiracy against him. That's when he gets dangerous. Do you have a specific case in mind, Doctor, a person that you're treating? No, it's out of my field. I'm a general practitioner, not a psychiatrist. Senor Doctor. Yes. Lady call on telephone, very sick. You come right away? Uh, did you get the address? Si, senor. Oh, thank you. Forgive me, please. Of course. Are you sure, Jeff? Then I'm positive it was the same man. Well, I'll talk to him if you want me to, but you know how it is with those fellows. They all look alike if you don't know them. Maybe you're right, Ben. So the guy gets up and he says, Keith, you take a powder. Oh, the guy was bigger than I am. What can I do? <laughs> 
same thing happened to me, only he wasn't so tall. Oh, I remember all too well. Hey, remember that evening? Excuse me, honey, I'll be back in a while. Certainly. Because the rest of the committee feel that a local architect should have the job. Ben, may I see you a moment? Surely. Excuse me, Jeff. Certainly. I could go from Minnesota. Good evening, Mr. Ferris. Uh, call me Keith. It was nice of you to find this secluded spot. Huh? Are you always this way when you've been drinking? Oh, now, this Miss Prim and proper business didn't fool me for a minute. I spotted you the first night. Don't. You don't have to pretend, honey. Just relax and enjoy it. Stop it. Are you kidding? Jeff. Hello, Galahad. Playing peeping Tom. Get out. Don't be ridiculous. As I was Would saying, you mind honey, leaving us alone? Jeff, please. I'd like don't. to have a few words with him. Privately. If I ever catch you around Ellen again, I'll run you out of Pine Cliff. Galahad, you frighten me. I'm warning you, I mean it. Keep away from her. I know too much about you. So what? You'll never open your mouth. That's the beauty of it. It's your story, and you're stuck with it. I don't have to open my mouth. I can close yours. What are you two boys arguing about? What does anybody ever argue about? Politics. Oh, politics. Uh, Keith, will you do me a favor? Dr. Hartley had to leave on an emergency call. Will you see that Dodo gets home? She has a little headache. Well, I'd be glad to. Ben, don't you think maybe I'd better? Look, I pay her alimony. I'll take her home. <laughs> It was a lovely, lovely party, darling. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You're sure I can trust you to take her straight home? Oh, the car knows the way, Ben, all by itself. Mm, good night, then. Uh, oh, Ben. Yes? It might be a good idea to keep an eye on Jeff tonight. See that he doesn't drink anymore. He was getting a little, uh, a little out of control. Uh, thanks, Keith. I'll watch him. Good night. Mm -hmm. Still cutting the last throat, I see. An inch at a time. Every little bit helps. Helps what? Or is it just your meanness on your part? Don't be stupid. Ben hasn't any ears, has he? All that money and not even a second cousin. Suppose he should take a notion to leave it all to Cahal, and where would I be? Out in my ear the day after the will was filed. Well, you don't think he's going to leave it to you, do you? No. No, I'm voting for charity. With Keith Ferris as administrator of the estate. What would you think of a, of a Vivian Shepherd Foundation for or something or other? That turns even my stomach. Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Oh, uh, you were in the cavalry, weren't you, Major? Well, I'd like to ask you a question. Can a horse break its leg in its own stall? What's that? You think it's a chance in a million? No, I was just computing the odds on an accident that happened last week. Well, thank you very much for the information, Major. Good night.
dog howling. And I, I thought... heard it, too. Could you tell where it came from? No. It's around here someplace, but I can't locate it. <laughs> Jeff, listen. about all we can do tonight. Jeff, I want to talk to you. Well, not now. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be rude, but I'm just not in the mood for conversation. You have to listen, it's important. Well, let's go up to the house. to Major Badger tonight. He can't understand how Shamrock could break his leg in his own stall. Well, he hasn't anything on me. I can't understand it either. That's bad luck. Don't call it luck, Jack. What would you call it? I'm not sure. A few days ago, this rose was on your matador bush. It was alive and beautiful. Now it's dead. Was that bad luck, or was it cause and effect? You picked it, so it died. I didn't pick it. The whole bush died overnight for no reason. There must be a reason. There's always a reason for everything. Is there? Maybe you can give me a reason for this. Take a good look at it. It looks different. Is it the way the light hits it? It isn't the light, it's the colors. Look at it again. Oh, I see what you mean. They faded, haven't they? All the life's gone out of it. Your rose bush dies. Your painting fades. But have you ever had a common, ordinary fall, Jeff? What do you mean? 65% of all accidents are falls. Falls down a flight of steps, falls out of a tree, falls off a ladder, or in a bathtub. But nothing of that sort ever happens to you. It's too ordinary. Your kind of accident has to be unique. What are you driving at? Your bad luck, Jeff. It's a little too bad to be true. Your porcelain figure fell off the table while nobody was in the house. Shamrock broke his leg while he was in his own stall. Now your picture fades. It's too bizarre, Jeff. The impossible can happen, but not over and over again. Are you trying to tell me they didn't happen? No, they happened all right, but it wasn't luck. Can't you see the pattern that runs through all your accidents? Shamrock, Mr. O'Grady, your picture, your statue, your rose bush, and the collision on the highway last year. That's when it all began. Six accidents, and every one of them killed something you loved. Do you know what the mathematical odds are against a run like that? A billion to one. Are you telling me they weren't accidents at all? No, I'm only trying to tell you that lightning can strike twice in the same place, Jeff, but not six times. You mean you think that all of these things have been planned by someone? Someone who hates you, who's trying to destroy you. Who could it be, Jeff? I don't know. We'll find out. We'll go back to the beginning, the night that Vivian was killed. We'll talk to the policeman who reported the accident. We'll find the garage they took the car to. We'll ask a thousand questions about the accident and about Vivian. Ellen. We'll start tomorrow morning. We'll look for witnesses. Ellen, wait a minute. Perhaps the ambulance driver will remember something. I'll find him and I'll talk to him. You won't talk to anyone. Well, why? Why won't I? Because I don't want you to. But, Jeff. Listen to me. I don't want you asking questions. I don't want you investigating anything. This is my affair. I'll handle it my own way. I was only trying to help you. Well, now you've let me know where I stand. You don't want any help from me. 
All right, then, do it your own way. Ellen, listen to me. Just don't let any black cats cross your path. And if you see a horseshoe, pick it up and spit on it and throw it over your shoulder. That ought to take care of everything. Ellen. Tell me good night, dear. I'm sorry. Is anything wrong? No, there isn't anything wrong. There isn't anything right either. I saw you come home. You were at Jeff's again, weren't you? Yes. I don't want you to think I'm an old busybody, but I'm all the family that you have, and it would help you to talk to someone. What is there to talk about? He doesn't love me. He never will. He's in love with a memory. I tried to warn you to be sensible. Sensible? I love him. I've got to help him if I can, whether he likes it or not. I know. Good night, dear. Good night, Aunt Amelia. Ellen. I've taken your painting to an art shop. You did what? I found out some very important information. If you come over tonight, I'll tell it to you. No, I can't tell you now. Look, I thought you understood I was going to handle this in my own way. Don't argue, Jeff. Just come on over. Goodbye. Well, what do you think? It's hard to understand why it's faded. The artist didn't use pen color, he didn't even use tempera. There must be a reason. I would say this was painted with London watercolor. That's the best you can get. Nothing fades them except continuous exposure to strong sunlight for at least a month. That's impossible. I can't imagine what caused it. Well, I tell you what I can do. I can talk to a couple of artists I know. They might have an idea. I think my best bet is to go and see Trillfield. He's a watercolor man. He's one of the best. He ought to know everything about it. I think I'll catch him tomorrow morning. You know Trillfield, the naturalist. He paints the dogs and horses and cows. My wife, he made a beautiful Thank painting. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to trouble you. Oh, no trouble at all. Oh, Miss Foster. Yes? I just remembered something. Years ago, I framed some pictures for a painter by the name of Torres. Vincente Torres. One of the paintings was an old lady playing the guitar. It was a watercolor. And it faded? Uh -huh. The man who bought the picture took sun lamp treatments that winter, and he took it on a couch right under the painting, and he was mystified why the color faded. So Vincente found out that the rays from the sun lamp broke down the pigment. Can you remember the name of the man who owned that picture? I don't think I ever knew. Some local man. What about the artist? Is he still in Pinecliff? Torres? He died five years ago. Oh. Thank you again. Very strange. Have you told anybody else about this? Of course not. But someone in Pinecliff knows that you can fade the colors out of a painting by turning a sun lamp on it. If we can find out who owns that picture, Jeff, the portrait of the old woman with the guitar... What would it prove? If 
somebody wants to destroy a painting, there must be a hundred easier ways of doing it. That's not all. Read this. Arsenic. In the soil underneath the matador bush, I dug it out this morning. Enough arsenic to burn out the whole root system. It didn't get there by accident, Jeff. Someone put it there. Someone who knows how to poison a rose bush. Or a dog. Or a man's life. Would you really like to help me? You know I would. And forget it. Forget the whole thing. But there was poison in the root system. The chemist told you me. You never saw the chemist. You never heard of a portrait of an old woman with a guitar. Do you understand? No. No, I don't understand. Jeff! Jeff! Your house. Look out the window. I saw it from upstairs. What? It's burning! No, he hasn't come in all day. Did you try to locate Mr. Yes, I did, but he left the house early this morning. Well, wait a second. Here he is now. Good, good. Have him come right in. Mr. Shepard wants to see you. So I hear. He'll be right in. Thank you. He's here now, Stacy. Hello, Ben. I didn't mean to keep you waiting. It was quite all right, Jeff. I'm terribly sorry about what happened last night. I know you are, thanks. I wouldn't bother you about anything today ordinarily, but Mr. Rogers here just came to town. Uh, Stacy Rogers, chairman of the hospital committee. Oh, of course. How are you, sir? I'm glad to know you. Uh, this is the Jeff Cohallan I recommended to you. Yes. We examined your plans last night, Mr. Cohallan. Good, clean, modern lines. Thank you. I'm sorry we couldn't give you the job. You couldn't what? I was just about to tell you, Ben. We decided on Talbot and Talbot. You did? Well, this is a surprise, Stacy. Which was it, Mr. Rogers? Politics or stupidity? I beg your pardon. If they'd given it to Magruder or Chesney and Pike, I wouldn't have said a word because I know the boys would have gotten a good, modern hospital. But Talbot and Talbot haven't had a new idea since Burnham did the Flatiron Building. Oh, now, take it easy, Jeff. Oh, they're not architects. They're political finaglers. Maybe you can tell me just one detail in their plan that was an improvement over mine. Name just one. Young man, your attitude doesn't deserve a reply. But since you're a friend of Mr. Shepard's, I will say to you that no member of the board, myself included, could understand how a reputable architect would submit his design for an important building with no interior detail whatsoever. No detail? 
There were 17 blueprints of the interior, right down to the placement of the operating tables and surgery. You may have drawn them, young man, but you didn't send them to us. There were no interior details? None at all. Could they have been misplaced somewhere in your office? Not possibly. The sealed packages were opened in the presence of the entire board. Uh, maybe you misplaced them, Jeff. You know how absent-minded you've been. Suppose you can find the duplicates. Would the board be willing to reconsider? That's impossible. The contract has already been awarded. Well, this is quite a shock, Stacy. I felt sure that Cohalan would get this job. Oh, I'm sorry, Ben, but you understand my position. Jeff, you weren't going on without me, were you? Without you? You told me to drop in at 5.30 and you'd drive me home. Do you remember? I'm not going home now. Oh, is anything wrong? Everything's wrong. Come on, let's get out of here. It's dreadful. A whole year's work completely wasted. Typical Cohal and luck. Don't keep calling it luck. Supposing someone took those plans out of the office and wrapped the package over again. Who'd do a thing like that? Keith would. He hates you. He hates everybody. There's something twisted inside of him. I would take a psychiatrist to explain it. And why does Mr. Shepard keep him on at the office? He doesn't know what he'd like. Dodo must know. She acts as though she's still in love with him. There are women who love men like Keith. I'd take a psychiatrist to explain that, too. It's getting kind of late. I'd better drive you home. Nothing. Drive faster, will you, Jeff? I want to feel the wind in my face. All right. Here you are, Miss Foster. 296 Hall Street. Paul River, Massachusetts. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Just one thing more. The accident happened on 12 Mile Drive, didn't it? That's right. Just three miles from Pinecliff. Thank you very much. Traffic department. Miss Foster. Who? Oh? Just a minute, please. Oh, Miss Foster. It's for you. For me? Hello? Uh, Miss Foster? Uh, this is Dr. Hartley. Uh, my office is just across the street. I saw you go into the police station as I parked my car. Are you in trouble, Miss Foster? In trouble? Why, no. I mean, not exactly. I think you'd better drop into my office. Uh, can you come over right away? Well, I, I have a long-distance phone call to make first. Well, just as soon as you complete your call. Yes. I, I think I can come by in about 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. It's all right. Miss Foster. Hello, Dr. Hartley. Come in. Come in. I was startled when you telephoned me at the police station. Well, I'm very glad I spotted you when I did. Why did you ask me if I was in trouble? Well, the fact is, I'm in rather an awkward position. But your aunt is getting along in years, and I didn't want to disturb her on Julie, so I thought it best to discuss this matter with you. Sit down. Sit down. Thank you. Yes, Doctor? Since I'm your aunt's physician, I feel it's my duty to inform you that she isn't safe. That neither one of you is safe, for that matter. So I wanted to get your permission to speak to your house guest to ask him to move to a hotel. But I don't understand. What is that to do with my aunt's safety? Yes, I was afraid you'd ask me that. 
The fact is, you're forcing me to take an unethical action. The man isn't my patient, and even if he were... Whatever it is you're trying to say, Doctor, why don't you just go ahead and say it? Yes, you're quite correct. I'll come to the point. Let me say that I believe your house guest, Mr. Kohallen, is definitely paranoiac. He seems to have all the obvious symptoms of delusions of persecution. If that's true, then you and your aunt are in a hazardous position. Two helpless women in the same house with a man who may become dangerous at any moment, we can't allow it. May I ask you a question, Doctor? Certainly. You speak of delusions of persecution, but... Or oh, delusion is imaginary, a thing that never happened. That's right. But Jeff's dog was poisoned. His house was burned down. That was no delusion. I saw it myself. Did you see the gasoline can? Gasoline can? The gasoline can the police found in the ruins of Hilltop. It was an unusual type of container. Only one store in Pine Cliff sells them. And that store sold such a can to Jeff last Monday. How do you know? The chief of police told me so this morning. But I don't see how. And that isn't all. The body of the dog was disinterred. He died of arsenic poisoning. Two days after his master brought a package of weed out. Are you trying to tell me that Jeff burned down his own house? That he poisoned his own dog? That's impossible. No man in his right mind. Exactly. No man in his right mind. But why? Why would he do a thing like that? Listen. Listen to this. Once the feeling of guilt is firmly established in the subconscious, the patient may do injury to himself as a form of penance or self-imposed retribution. Such actions may be taken without conscious volition and will often disappear entirely from the memory stream so that the patient is later unaware that his injuries were self-inflicted. That's my theory, that Jeff is suffering from feelings of guilt and he's unconsciously punishing himself for it. Guilt? You keep talking about guilt. I don't understand you. What is he guilty of? His fiancée was killed in an automobile accident a year ago and he was at the steering wheel at the time. It would be an unusual man who didn't reproach himself under those circumstances, even if he was blameless. And if he thought he was responsible for the death of the woman he loved, if the thought began to prey on his mind, it's rather an obvious theory, isn't it? Yes. Then I have your permission to speak to him. I'll be as tactful as possible. No, not yet. Not until Friday. Friday? I've got to have time to think about it. I'll be very careful, but promise me you won't speak to him yet. Well, I can't force my opinions on you, Miss Foster, but I must emphasize as strongly as I can that delay can be dangerous, extremely dangerous. I'll be very, very careful, Dr. Hartley. I hope you will, Miss Foster. Thank you. man must be crazy. Thank you very much.
Jeff? Oh, well. Jack of spades. Is that bad luck? Like a black cat? A dead man's card. Oh? Is there a card for a dead woman? The queen of spades. I almost drew it this afternoon. Oh, what happened? Oh, I just gotten off the bus and was waiting to cross the street, and a car nearly ran me down. It almost seemed to be trying to. Did you see the driver? No. I was too busy trying to get out of the way. What, uh, what kind of a car was it? A green convertible, like yours, except the top was up. You've got to get out of here, Ellen. You've got to get out of Pine Cliff right away. Why, Jack? Because something else is going to happen. I, I can feel it. It might happen to you. I'm not going to leave. Not now. I'm warning you, Ellen. It's no use. I'm not going. You're asking for trouble. Am I? And I'll really ask for it. Watch yourself closely. Watch yourself every minute. Don't trust anybody. Not even you? Not even me. Well, I think I'll go to bed now. Major Badger said he'd come by in the morning and take us to church. You won't forget what I said. You'll be careful. I'll be careful. Jeff. Yes? How long have you known Dr. Hartley? For years, ever since I came to Pine Cliff. Has there ever been any bad feeling between you? No, why should there be? Well, he thinks that the shock of Vivian's death might have affected your mind. He thinks that you might be paranoid. No, I don't think so. Good. Good night, Jeff. Good night, Ellen.
Shh. I had to see you again. I wanted you to have this. Don't be afraid to use it if you have to. I want you to wait for me tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning? You mustn't leave the house. You mustn't leave the house without me. I promise you won't. All right, Jeff. I promise. You won't forget when Major Badger arrives? No, I won't forget. Good girl. On Jeff early the next morning. I can still smell the fumes of the gasoline as we pulled his body from the car. But somehow it didn't quite ring true. I couldn't believe that Jeff would try to kill himself. No suicide note was found, but the local architect was discovered in the Foster garage with the door closed and his car motor running. He was immediately removed to City Hospital, where latest reports from Dr. Raymond Hartley advised that Cohalan is now definitely out of danger. On the national scene, Congress resumed its discussion of the Morse Conlon bill today. Labor spokesmen have announced that they will request an amendment guarantee. I'd like some more coffee, nurse. With cream and sugar? How did you get by the no visitors sign? I walked right straight past it to ask you a question. Oh, you did? Well, suppose you walk right straight past it again, going the other way. Not till you've answered my question. Would you rather I rang for a nurse? Oh, you weren't that way on Saturday night when you needed me. I made you a promise then and I kept it. Now I think you owe me the answer to one question. Just one? Well, I won't ask you why you came to my room that night. I know the answer to that one. Oh, you do? Certainly. You wanted to make sure that I'd find you on Sunday morning before the motor ran too long. You probably didn't start it until after the Major rang the doorbell. You don't miss much, do you? You counted on that, too. You knew that when we couldn't find you in your room, I'd think of looking in the garage and I'd thank you to see if your car was still there. You have all the answers, haven't you? All except one. Why did you fill those buckets with gasoline? Fill the buckets? Oh, you saw that, too? Yes. I wasn't filling buckets. I was draining the gas tank. So if you didn't show up in time, the motor would stop running as soon as the gas in the carburetor was gone. But why? Why did you do it? You had your question. Don't be technical. Why did you pretend to commit suicide? When that car almost ran you down Saturday morning, you don't think that was an accident, do you? I couldn't get you to leave town, so I had to give him a different target. Different target? Me. A man doesn't kill my rose bush and my horse and my dog and then stop there. He must want to kill me. I can't wait any longer, not while strange automobiles are trying to run you down on the highway. I've got to force his hand now. I want him to think that it's safe to take a shot at me. Don't you understand? Not quite. I've tried to commit suicide, haven't I? It was on the radio. It says so right here. So what if somebody takes a shot at me now and leaves the gun in my hand? It's an open and shut case, isn't it? The police wouldn't even investigate. So he's free to kill me now if he can. Doesn't have to hit around the edges anymore. But keep away from me. Don't stand too close to the target. Is that why you wanted me to leave Pinecliff? That's why I want you to go home now and stay there. Lock the doors from the inside. If you have any visitors, don't let Aunt Amelia out of your sight. Don't trust anyone. Where will you be if I want to find you? I don't know, but I have to get out of here. I can't wait for him to make the next move. I've got to get out and go after him. You say the exhibit was in 1939? The summer of 39. I ought to have that catalog somewhere. Yeah. And there's a list of all of the exhibitors in here? In the back of the book. Practically oh. every artist who might have known Torres. 
Oh, yes. This is perfect. Exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yes? Are you Mr. Strabini? Strabini? Uh, yes, that's me. Did you ever know an artist by the name of Vincente Torres? Vincente Torres? Yes. <laughs> no. Vincente Torres? Certainly, I knew him well. Watercolor man. No sense of depth. Do you recall a painting he did, a portrait of an old woman with a guitar? An old woman with a guitar? Don't believe I ever saw it. The old woman with a guitar? Yes, I remember when Torres painted it. It was during his Renoir period. Do you remember who he sold it to? Didn't know he ever found a sucker. It was a piece of tripe. Well, thank you. Not at all. Mr. Cohelan. Hello, Sue. You had a few phone calls. Anything important? I don't think so. A man named Carter called. Said he was a friend of an artist that you knew. The name sounded like Boris. Was it Torres? It could be. Did he leave a number? No. He said he'd call back around six. What's after that now? When Mr. Shepard's anxious to see you. He's still in the office. Okay. Shepard is safe. Oh, yes, just a minute. Mr. Carter. Hello. Yes, that's the man, Vincente Torres. Uh, do you remember a watercolor he painted, a portrait of an old woman with a guitar? You do? Do you remember who bought it? You're absolutely certain? Oh, thank you. Yeah. just the man I've been looking for. They wouldn't let me in the hospital, and you seem to have disappeared since you got out. Well, I had some important things to do, Ben. Well, anyhow, you're here now. That's the main thing. Uh, of course, I know it was an accident, boy. You couldn't have done it deliberately. Couldn't I? Of course not. But just the same, you've been overworked lately. You're looking all fagged out. It's time you took a rest. Yes, I could use a rest. A nice long rest. <sighs> Just what I had in mind. As a matter of fact, I'm tired myself. That's why I'm thinking of taking a trip. See something of the world before I get too old. Sounds like a fine idea, Ben. It would be a good idea for you too, Jeff. Why don't you come along with me? The two of us could have a pleasant time together. Leave all our worries behind and take things easy for a while. What kind of a trip were you thinking of, Ben? Oh, I haven't made up my mind. Where would you like to go? Oh, an ocean voyage might be nice. If the ship had a low rail and a long drop to the water. Or Niagara Falls might be handy, or the top of the Empire State Building. Don't talk like that, Jeff. Don't even think of such things. I, uh, wasn't thinking of suicide, Ben. I don't expect to jump. I expect to be pushed. You're crazy, Jeff. You're talking like a paranoiac. Where did you get that word, Ben? Did you read it in a book, complete with all the symptoms? I'm only trying to help you, but if you're going to take this... Sit down, Ben. Sit down and listen. You had all the tools to work with, didn't you? Your ranch hands who think you're a king will do anything you tell them to. I was out your place yesterday, Ben, looking for Pedro. They told me he didn't work for you anymore. He hadn't since the day after my house burned down. You let him go, didn't you? After he'd done his job. I'm beginning to think the doctor's right. I'm beginning to believe you do have delusions of persecution. Paranoia, Ben. You learned the word. Use it. 
When did you first plant the idea in Hartley's mind? Did you say, I'm a little worried about Jeff, and tap your finger on your forehead? Jeff, I'm not going to talk to you any longer. You're not in your right, not while you're in your present mood. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You haven't answered my questions, Ben. Are they too difficult? Let's see if you can answer an easy one. Whatever happened to that painting that used to hang in your living room, the portrait of an old woman with a guitar? It wasn't in the living room, it was in my study. Why? When did you get rid of it, Ben? After it faded? After you found out what a sun lamp can do to a watercolor? You want to know who put me on your trail? You did yourself. When you tried to convince me I couldn't trust my memory anymore. I hate to say this, Jeff, but you can't trust your mind anymore. Can't I? I made a written list the night I wrapped the hospital plans to make sure nothing was left out. And 17 blueprints were missing when the package was opened by the state board. No one could have tampered with that package but you. No one else knew it would be on my desk overnight. I didn't know anything. Yes, you did. I told you. At the country club. You wanted to destroy my faith in my work, didn't you? It was the only thing I had left. Oh, Jeff, this is ridiculous. That's what I thought at the beginning. But once I began to suspect you, it all fitted together. I even remembered that your foreman was in the store the day I bought the can of gasoline. That gave you an idea, didn't it? Yes. It gave me an idea. How do you like your own medicine? How do you like waking up every morning wishing you were dead? Then you don't deny it anymore. I'm glad you found out, because you can't do anything about it. Go tell somebody I poisoned your dog. Go say I burned down your house. You know what they'll think, don't you? They'll think you're crazy. I don't care about the others. It's what you think that's important. You've been like a father to me, Ben. In a funny kind of way, you still are. What made you change? What made you start to hate me? Was it Vivian? You killed her. I did everything for you that one man can do for another. And how did you repay me? You murdered her. Not murder, man. Not murder. A drunken man at the wheel of an automobile. What is he if he isn't a murderer? Can't go in there. No, get out of there. Can't go in there. No. Ellen. What are you doing? Jeff. Mr. Shepard, this is Mr. Nelson of Fall River, Massachusetts. Last year he was driving through California, and when he reached Pine Cliff, he had an accident on 12 mile drive. Is this the man who was driving the car in which the girl was killed? Well, uh... You said not to say anything when you paid my damages. Go ahead, answer. No. No, it wasn't. It was that fellow back there. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. I tried to keep it from you, Ben. At the party you gave the night before Vivian and I were to be married, I don't know whether you remember or not, I said something to you about the room being a little stuffy. I wanted to go outside for some air. I was really looking for Vivian. I found her all right. I heard them talking to each other. It wasn't anything new, Ben. It had been going on for years, all the time I was overseas. He was telling her why he'd never marry her. He couldn't. Dodo wouldn't give him a divorce. So she said, we'll run away without a divorce. stop them if I could. He was going as fast as the curving road would let him. I tried to catch him, but he was driving like a madman. 
We were coming to the fork where 12 Mile Drive meets the highway. I saw a car approaching on the main road. Ferris didn't see the other car. I knew what was coming, but there was nothing I could do to stop it. I jumped out of my car and ran toward the wreck. He said, do something, do something for her. But there was nothing anyone could do for Vivian. There was only one thing left to do for anybody. I told him to take my car and get away from there. I didn't want you to find out how she died, Ben. Or what she was really like. I'm sorry you had to know, Ben. Even now. Vivian, I always gave you everything you wanted from the time you were a little girl. You were all I had after your mother ran away. She was so good. I never told you that, did I? Your mother was no good. Now you want to run away, too. You're just like her. The same bad blood. Jeff, he thinks I... I know. I won't go through that again. I'll kill you first. I'll kill both of us. <laughs> Down that gun. Put it down. She ran away. She ran away from me. Call Dr. Hartley. Well, you finally fixed me with the old man, didn't you? But you'll never get any of his money now. He's as nutty as a squirrel. <coughs> now get out of here. Get out of Pinecliff. If I ever see you again, I'll kill you. Dr. Hartley, this is Ellen Foster. Will you come over to Mr. Shepard's office right away? Yes, yes, it's urgent. Thank you. It's all right, Ben. Everything's going to be all right. <laughs> well, Dr. William, then? He's healing beautifully. No infection, no complications, simple perforation of the deltoid. And all the time I thought it was my shoulder. <laughs> you won't need that thing anymore. Good. Yeah. He'll be as good as new in a week. Tell me about Ben. Well, Amelia, Ben was the psychopath, of course, from the beginning. I ought to have suspected it, of course. Now he's had what the psychiatrists call a catharsis. He's brought his troubles out into the open. Ellen helped to bring them out when she phoned Fall River. He'll be all right now, in time. Well, I'm very really happy to hear that. Well, I hate to drag myself away, but the ill and injured are waiting. I'll see you to your car, Doctor. Bye, Ellen. Jeff. Goodbye, Doctor. So long, Doc. And now, young lady, suppose you come along with me. Ellen. Yes, Jeff? There's something I've been wanting to ask you. Yes, Jeff? How in the world did you ever find that fellow from Fall River? Oh. Oh, I found him in the traffic accident records at the police station. What made you think of him? The way you drove your car on 12 Mile Drive the other night. You could never have driven so recklessly with me if you'd been at the wheel when Vivian was killed. Not on the same road in the same place at the same time of night. You're pretty smart, aren't you? No. Yes, you are. You're very smart. No, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. No, because I thought that you loved her. I thought you loved her all the time. I never really loved anyone. But you.